Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are just about to get started, but uh, for now, I want you to familiarize yourselves with the screen in front of you. Uh, throughout our presentation, we're going to be, um, you know, able to answer your questions. So, in the screen in front of you, there is a little icon that looks like a speech bubble with a little question mark. If you click that, you can enter um, any of your questions in the text field, and you can go ahead and try it out right now. Um, this is being uh, uh, this is a webcast, so you are going to be logging in whether your mobile device or your laptop. So if for some reason during the presentation um, the connection cuts out, obviously that may be Wi-Fi or internet connection. You can refresh your page to jump right back in. Um, and if for some reason you can't connect back in, don't worry, we will be sending you a video of the session um, within 24 hours, so you can always catch the replay. So if you're just joining, we're about to begin. Um, there is a little uh, questions box. It looks like a speech bubble with a little question mark on it. You can use that to write in your questions uh, during our presentation, and one of my colleagues will be able to answer for you. Um, you will have we will be able to ask your questions throughout the presentation, um, and we can also ask questions at the end as well. Um, and of course, if I can't answer your questions during this presentation, uh, don't worry, we're gonna be collecting them and we will email you after the fact to provide some answers. Okay. So now that everyone's here, um, welcome everyone to Boost Your Reading Skills for the DLPT. My name is Priscilla Colon. I'm the School and Faculty Engagement Manager for Transparent Language. I'm a former language teacher, project manager in educational publishing, and I'm currently, I'm currently a customer trainer and advocate. I love testing new technology and obviously bringing you some of these awesome webinars to share information that we find along the way. So during today's presentation, um, we're going to be talking about the types of texts that you may encounter during your DLPT or any other uh, language test. We're gonna be talking about the structural approach um, to analyzing the questions that you may encounter and the text so that you can answer them appropriately. Um, we're gonna go through um, the basic approach for each of the levels. Um, ILR 1 to 1 plus, 2 to 2 plus, and 3 to 3 plus. We're going to be seeing some sample uh, texts as well, and we'll get to practice some of the strategies that we talk about. I'm going to be providing some test taking tips and also some wonderful CO150 resources. So you're going to be the first to know about some amazing things coming up in 2023. Um, so we'll go through that today. And as I mentioned, um, during our presentation today, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the little chat slash question box and my colleague Megan will be interrupting me so that I can answer them for you. If I'm not able to answer your questions, uh, we'll gather them up and answer them for you after that. So let's start uh, by talking about some of the strategies that we're going to be um, discussing today. So the first thing is that you can apply them to any reading test, uh, language or proficiency level. So um, the strategies that I talk about, we may be showing you some examples in English and Spanish, but they can be applied to any language, any proficiency level, and any type of uh, reading test, just like the DLPT. They also build up on each other. So as we go through, we're, we may talk about the strategies for the, let's say ILR, one to one plus, but these strategies will also then build up to the next ones and the next ones until you get to the more complex higher levels. The other thing is, bad news, there are no shortcuts. So these strategies have to be applied um, in conjunction with your studying. So um, you'll see that as we go through these strategies, you're going to need to be doing your studying just like you would for any test. And in conjunction with that, apply the strategies so that you can ace those tests. So let's begin with the types of nonfiction texts that you will encounter during a DLPT or any type of reading test. These involve two types. So one of them is the informational texts that are used at, 
the lower levels exclusively. So these are focused on facts, things like road signs, weather forecasts, basic news articles. Uh, you're very much aware of these types of tests, I'm sure, at those lower levels. At the higher levels, you're going to be finding more of the nonfiction narratives. So in the intermediate and advanced levels, these are mostly going to be fact-based storytelling with opinions or persuasion in mind. Um, these include memoirs, documentaries, op-eds, sports commentary. So anything that includes someone's opinion um, and most likely they're going to try to persuade you of their opinions and their perspectives. So what this structural approach is going to do that we're going to be going over is that it's going to break things down so that we can understand the individual components, that is the words, the sentences, and the whole text. So we're going to be acting as detectives as we go through and we analyze the questions that were being asked on the tests as well as the passages themselves. So at the ILR one to one plus level, at this point, we're going to be looking at words and word construction, so their meanings, et cetera. At the ILR 2 and 2 plus levels, now we're going to be adding sentence and sentence construction. That's what we're going to be analyzing. And at the ILR 3 and 3 plus, we're going to be looking at the whole text. So what does it look like with all of those pieces together? We're also going to be looking specifically for the author's intention or perspective, their opinion. But in order to do that, you're going to have to understand the format of nonfiction text. So there is a very specific format um, that we're going to go over during today's presentation. Okay, and of course, some of the benefits to this structural approach is that you're going to be able to infer the meaning of vocabulary, especially words that you may not understand because you haven't encountered them before. This structural approach also allows you to focus on the main topic. So as you know, there are many passages that include a lot of superfluous information, but the structural approach is going to keep you focused so that you can home in on the actual information that you need to answer the questions. And of course, this approach also allows you to verify your hypotheses, make inferences, and really understand the questions and the passages as a whole. Okay, so let's get started with ILR 1 to 1 plus, and we're gonna be looking at word analysis. Now let's begin with a short checklist. The key to looking at these uh, questions and um, passages at this level is to understand the role of an unknown word in a sentence. In order for you to do that, you'll ask yourself several questions. For example, what type of text is it? Is it a road sign, an advertisement, a personal note, right? Is the word that you're encountering a proper noun or a brand name? So that's going to give you a clue. Or is this word a verb? And if it is a verb, is it in the past or present or future tense? So what, what is the role of that verb in that sentence? And can you tell if there's a grammar pattern in the word that you're encountering? And does that grammar pattern then allow you to um, figure out what it means in English? And then what is this whole uh, word's role um, how does it relate to the rest of the sentence? So for example, if it's, a, if it's the proper noun or brand name, is the subject of the sentence? If it's the verb, is it the action, um, et cetera? So as you can see, we're focusing on just the word analysis itself. And you'll see next why that's going to be per, uh, important in figuring out um, when you encounter a question and figuring out what the possible answer is. So let's go to our very first example. So this might be a passage that you encounter at the ILR1 level. You'll notice that it is from a very short biography. There are only a few sentences here, and I've given you the Spanish at the top and the English at the bottom. Now, again, these strategies are language agnostic. I just wanted to give you a sense of what it might look like in another language. 
but we're not going to be looking at the passage first so here's one of the first strategies you want to go to the question first so let's jump over to the question and this is a sample question that you might get at the level so let's read the question out loud it says what is rigoberta's personal calling or vocation so let's look at some of the words that we see in this question first to make sure that we understand it. So I see Rigoberta, that looks like a um, proper noun, a person's name. Now I'm going to look at some of the key words here. And the key words in the rest of this question are personal calling or vocation. Now this gives me a clue that this is what I'm gonna be looking at when I go back to analyze the text. Th these are the key words that I'm looking for. <clears throat> Uh, the next thing I'm going to look at is the possible responses. So you'll notice that all of these possible responses are verbs. So again, this is a clue that when you find the answer, it's probably going to be a verb. Now, the next thing you want to do after you read the question is you want to start by figuring out if you can eliminate a uh, distractor. So you know that three of these are incorrect and one of them is correct. Usually when you see these um, test questions, two of the possible answers are going to be very obviously incorrect. So we're gonna to try to eliminate at least one or two of these possible answers. So let's take a look at the answers. So what is Rigoberta's personal calling or vocation? So A, to receive a Nobel Prize. Well, maybe she's a very ambitious woman, so I'm not, I don't know if this is incorrect, so I'm just gonna leave that one there. B, to become part of an indigenous tribe from Guatemala. Well, this seems a little, seems a little off to me. I think you have to be born into an indigenous tribe, so I'm going to eliminate that as a possible response. So I've already eliminated one of my distractors. Okay, C, to help indigenous people from her country and all over the world. That could be a possible answer. And then D, to become an exceptional woman. Maybe, I mean, I guess if she's very ambitious, that might be one of her, um, uh, one of the answers. So I'm just gonna eliminate one for now. And now I'm going to try to figure out what the answer is. So let's keep in mind, personal calling or vocation. Those are the key words that I'm going to look for. Now let's go back to the uh, passage itself. Okay, here's my passage. I'm going to look for words that remind me of personal calling or vocation. So I see right here clearly in the Spanish and obviously the English translation that it says personal mission, misión personal. So now that I've identified the keywords from the question, I've identified it in the text, now I know that the answer is most likely in this sentence. So let's take a look carefully at the sentence. And sure enough, it says, her personal mission is to help the indigenous people of her country and around the world. So this clearly tells me that the answer is C, to help indigenous people from her country and all over the world. So as you can see, this strategy of word analysis means that you carefully um, break down the components of your question, you look for keywords, and then you use those keywords to look for the response within the passage. And those responses are most likely going to be within that same sentence, at this level, within that same sentence, where you find the keywords. So it's super simple, right? However, it just means that I don't have to study. If I didn't know, for example, how to say, Mission personal, personal mission, if I didn't understand that, it would be very hard for me to even find that response within the passage. Okay, so any questions up until this point? No questions yet, Priscilla. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So let's move on to ILR22+, and we're gonna be talking about sentence analysis. So just like with our first level, we're going to be going through a checklist. So the thing that we're gonna be focusing on 
at this level is understanding who is doing what in the sentence. So remember, we're building up on the strategies that you already know. So at this point, you're going to ask yourself, what adjectives describe the who, the subject, and their actions, what they're doing? Are these adjectives positive, negative, or neutral? So they're gonna tell you this person is doing this thing in a positive, a negative, or a neutral way. Are there words providing information on when and where the action is taking place? And then how does the sentence structure relay who, what, when, and where? So again, you're looking for the who, the what they're doing, the how they're doing it, when are they doing it, and where are they doing it? And you're going to put all of this together and use your interpretive skills. Now, what I mean by interpretive skills is that you're going to be creating a picture in your mind using all that information to kind of set the scene and tell the story so that you can understand what is happening in your own language. It does not mean that you're translating word for word. You're just taking the pieces of information, taking those components, and then creating the story in your mind. So let's take a look at an example at the ILR2 level. So you'll notice, first of all, just by looking at the size of this text, it's going to be a little bit more lengthy, right? Um, you're also going to be looking at maybe some domain-specific vocabulary. So you'll notice the little headline says, from a commentary on constitutional rights. So that's going to be very important. Um, and this is where we say, um, you'll notice that you, there really aren't any shortcuts. You need to understand the vocabulary the, um, going in in order to be able to understand this passage. But again, we're not going to focus right now on the passage. We're going to go to the question first. So let's take a look at this example question. This paragraph supports the statement that police can seize evidence of a crime without a search warrant. So remember, we're looking at who is doing what. So if we take a look at that in this sentence, the who is police and what are they doing? Seizing evidence. That's gonna be key for us to keep in our minds when we look for um, the answer. The other key word that the other key phrase in this case that we're looking for is without a search warrant. So this is very specifically, they're asking, police can seize evidence without a search warrant under what cases? Um, so like we did the last time, we can go through and eliminate distractors. So let's take a quick look at some of the sample answers. If you voluntarily provide consent when complying with a police request, they can seize evidence. It could be, I'm not really sure. Uh, B, if the evidence is in plain view and the police are legitimately at the location. Well, I've watched a lot of Law and Order. Um, that sounds about right to me, but I still have A, so I'm not going to eliminate that. Um, after police listen to the confession of a criminal act, not really sure about that one. And the last one is if the evidence can easily be moved or destroyed. You know, in this case, I really don't know if I should eliminate any of these, and that's okay. So I want to show you that you may not be able to eliminate distractors. Does anyone want to guess what the answer is before we go to uh, the actual passage? And you feel free to write A, B, C, or D in the chat box. I'll give you just a few seconds for that. And Megan, is anyone writing in? Can we see what some of the responses are? It looks like we have some fellow Law & Order fans. A lot of people are saying B. Okay, <laughs> so it's good, you came prepared. <laughs> um, so imagine that you did not know what the answer was, right? And remember, it's um, even though the questions are in English, the text itself is going to be in the other language that you're testing in. So let's go to the passage to figure out if we can find the responses. And we're gonna kind of home in on 
police using evidence without a search warrant. So we're going to keep that in mind. Okay. So the first thing is I'm going to go to the passage and I'm going to look for something that reminds me of without a search warrant. So keywords, and I find one, it says exception, exception. So that is how you're going to kind of home in on where the response might be. And just like we did with the ILR one to one plus text, I'm going to look for the answer in that vicinity, you know, proximity. So here we go in that sentence, we see that it says exception, the plain view exception. Police do not need a warrant to seize evidence in plain view. So just like we did the first time, we were able to home in on, uh, in, on those uh, keywords and find the response right within that same uh, sentence or uh, following sentence. And all of you Law & Order fans were correct. The answer is B, if the evidence is in plain view and the police are legitimately at the location. So you see how that works? Um, so even if the uh, text is in a different language, you'll be able to use that kind of sentence analysis to be able to home in on that response, find the location of those keywords, and then find the response within very close proximity. Okay, any questions on that sentence analysis approach before we move on to the next level? No questions yet. Okay, sounds good. Now let's get to ILR 3 and 3 plus. This is when we do more of the whole text analysis. And here, the goal again is going to be identifying repetition of concepts, terms, and ideas. But it's not just anywhere, it's really in key sections. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a specific format that the text at these levels are going to have. So the key sections that you're gonna be looking for, repetition of ideas, are going to be the title, the headline, or the subheadline, right? This seems like a no-brainer, right? Uh, but we sometimes forget because it's really right there in plain view. The titles, the headlines are gonna give you a gist and they're gonna be a first indicator of the content. Um, especially when you're reading authentic texts um, published online, keywords are really important for search engine optimization. So you're going to find those within the headlines and the titles. So this is important. Don't overlook the obvious. The other section where you're going to find this repetition of concepts, terms, and ideas is the introduction. This is going to be the first paragraph or paragraphs or the first sentences. Again, um, it's a no-brainer, but we kind of forget about these very basic, you know, facts. And the other place where you're going to find this is in the conclusion. Um, this is going to be the last paragraph or paragraphs. It's the final indicator. It's the place where the writer is reiterating their ideas. So title, introduction, and conclusion. Those, that's, those are the places where you need to focus on to find the answers. Um, to your test questions. One thing to note is that for ads and promos, persuasive texts, nonfiction narratives, those tend to um, use a lot of like tongue in cheek, um, rhetorical devices. And so sometimes, in addition to looking at the titles or headlines, you might need to also look at the topic sentence of each paragraph. So, you know, imagine there's, you know, for example, there, there may be like clickbaity titles. So you need to then look at those topic sentences to get additional information to really verify whether you got the main idea correct. Okay, so now that you know the format, we're going to be looking at an example at this level. Now, these tend to be very lengthy. So this is when the structural approach is really going to help you. You don't want to spend a lot of time reading everything. You want to focus in on the areas where you're most likely going to find the answers. And just like we did with the previous um, passages, we're not going to read it all. We're just going to skip over to the question. 
Okay, so you, I'm going to give you a couple of sample questions. One is more at the ILR2 level, uh, 2 plus level, and then we're going to look at a little bit harder one. So let's start with the 2 plus uh, sample question. The question is, the coconut earned the nickname ghost because, okay, so a couple of keywords here. First, because that word indicates that the question is asking why. So that's what we're looking for, the why. A keyword is going to be ghost. And so that you're going to be looking for ghost why. And what is the subject of the sentence? Coconut. So coconut is called ghost why. That is exactly what you're going to be looking for when we go to analyze the passage. Just like we did before, let's try to see if we can eliminate some possible um, distractors. So the coconut earned the nickname ghost because of its pale color. Well, I know coconuts and ghosts tend to be pale or white in color, so I'm not going to eliminate that one. That's a possible response. B, because it resembles a face. Well, coconuts and ghosts can have faces, so I will not eliminate that either. C, because of its smell. I've never heard of a ghost smelling like a coconut, so I'm going to say that's a distractor. And um, because it is round. Well, coconuts are round, but ghosts look like people, so I will say that's a distractor as well. So look at that. We've already eliminated two possible answers, and now we can focus on the first two, pale color or resembling a face. Now, we're going to be using the keyword ghost and trying to answer the question, why? So let's go to our text. The first thing is I want to look at every place in which the word ghost appears. So, yep, fantasma, fantasma, la cara de este fantasma, ghost, ghostly creature, ghost face. There it is. Now that we have identified where this keyword is, we know that the answer is going to be around these sentences. So three different sentences, three different possible locations for the answer. So the first one says the word coco means meaning ghost. Okay, so it's just telling us that it means ghost. We've established that. The second one says uh, el coco personifies a ghostly creature used to frighten children who don't want to go to sleep on time. Okay, but does that answer why? And then the last one, here's where we see our response. The three dimples and furry texture of the seed reminded them of the ghost's face. So, if I think we've got our answer here, and you can see from the lovely picture, that's right. Um, so the coconut earned the nickname ghost because it resembles a face. Did anyone get that? Yep, again, we have a we have a smart group with us, most mostly bees. Mostly bees. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, next. Now let's look at a possible um ILR3 sample question, and these are going to throw you a curveball. So again, um, you know, you're going to have to do your studying. It's the, These are not going to be uh, quite easy, but we're going to try to figure out how we may be able to dissect the question for you and um, also figure out where the answers are. So let's take a look at the question first. What ghost-like creature from U.S. folklore best compares to El Coco? So this requires you to know, have a little bit more in-depth knowledge about, keyword here, U.S. folklore. So you're using what you're learning within the passage to then compare it and draw your own conclusions, make your own inferences. So just like before, let's start by eliminating distractors. So the first one, possible response, the Loch Ness Monster. Um, that's not in the US. So right there, we know that is not correct. Um, B, the tax man. I know that scares a lot of us, but 
I don't think that's correct. So we're left with two possible responses. Is it C, the boogeyman, or D, Bigfoot? Take just a few seconds to write in what you think the response is, the correct response is in the chat box. And do we have any responses, Megan? We are coming back with unanimous for C. Oh, not Bigfoot. Oh, poor Bigfoot. Okay, so let's see if you were correct. So we're going to go back to the text and we're going to look at some specific details that they provide us. So if you remember that second sentence with the word ghost in it, it specifically says, Coco personifies a ghostly creature used to frighten children who don't want to go to sleep on time. So this specific creature is used to frighten children. So all of those who answered the boogeyman were correct. Um, and so that really brings us to, you know, the conclusion to this kind of structural approach where we're able to go in, first figure out um, what uh, the words are, for example, the word analysis at the lower levels, you focus on those keywords, uh, figure out if they're proper nouns, brand names, verbs or sentences, uh, verbs and their tenses, and then what the role is in the larger sentence, help you identify those grammar patterns so that you can figure out you know, what they might be in English, and then you can answer that at that level. When you uh, follow on with the ILR 2, 2 plus, now you're really looking at sentence analysis, right? So you're answering who's doing what, that's your subject and your verb. You're looking at the descriptive qualities of your subjects and actions, those are your adjectives. You're identifying whether you are, you know, finding words that tell you when and where, and you use your own interpretive skills to infer the meanings of those words. You're telling a story using those pieces of information so that you can come to your own conclusions and answer those questions. And then as you get to the higher level text, you're going to be looking at the concepts or ideas that are repeated. For example, in that text, ghost was repeated over and over again. You're going to be looking at the titles or headlines, the introductions, the conclusions, and for some of the trickier texts, you're going to be looking at the topic sentences of each of the paragraphs as well. So are there any questions on these strategies before we talk about test taking tips? Yep, we had a good question specifically about whole text analysis. Um, yes. Someone wants to know, should we read the entire passage or just read and focus on sentences with the keywords in them? You should really be focusing on the sentences with the keywords in the specific key sections. So that title, the introduction, the conclusion, and the topic sentences. Many of these passages may be too long for you to be able to read the whole way through. And a lot of them will have a lot of superfluous information, a lot of extra information that you that may actually distract you uh, from what the questions are actually asking. So follow the format that we've been showing you where you go to the question first, you read the question, the possible responses, and then you go to those key sections to look for the possible answers using the, the keywords that you identified within the passage, if that helps establish it. Yeah, I think that helps I'll let you know if anyone comes back or, or if that person has a follow on question. Okay, perfect. So let's go to test taking tips. Um, the first thing is uh, pretty obvious. Uh, you want to be easing your test anxiety because nothing will throw you off <laughs> like anxiety. So one of the ways that you can do this is actually to immerse yourself in language before the test. You want to be reading, listening, watching, and thinking in your target language. Um, so one of the things you can do, you know, leading up to your test and even on test date is, you know, uh, listen to your favorite song in language, listen to your favorite podcast in language, watch the news in language, talk to a friend in language. You want to get your brain warmed up just like you would when you go to the gym. You need a little warm up phase and it's going to be much easier for you to then be able to take the test because it's you're already thinking in that language. 
Um, another tip for when you are um, taking this test is that you want to answer every question. You get points for your correct answers, but you don't lose points for your incorrect answers. So make sure that, you know, even if you're making a guess, make an educated guess. It, you have nothing to lose here. So answer every question. And one of the things that we practiced today was reading the questions before reading the passage, because the questions will give you the key information to look for um, before you read the passage. And that that's really gonna help you uh, narrow down. Um, it'll save you some time and it just it's overall going to put you in the right place help you focus on the right um paragraphs and or sections of the passage and so on and um one really cool thing uh that we have coming up for you is our reading and listening refresher courses so you know you can put these tips and strategies uh apply them by yourself. But of course, if you're working with someone, um, it's even better because then you can hone your skills, maybe work on some uh, weak areas. So in 2023, we're gonna be launching this refresher course. It's designed to help you with your reading tests, such as an L uh, DLPT at the ILRs two, two plus and three. Um, you can do either a two or a four week full-time course that you can complete anywhere. All the course, uh, the course materials were also crafted specifically uh, for linguists um, covering your domains, politics, economy, technology, cyber, and so on. And if you're um, a DOD linguist, this is going to help you uh, with your annual slate requirements. Um, and you know, if you're with another organization, you may have other language requirements as well. So this is a perfect opportunity to fulfill those. Uh, our instructors, I have to say, are absolutely wonderful. They are highly experienced with uh, government language needs. Many of them are former DLI and FSI um, instructors as well. So they're very familiar with what you need to prep for these sorts of tests. Um, they're also going to be able to guide you. Uh, just like you know, we did this little mini uh, session today, they're going to be able to guide you with more complex texts at your level so you can build comfort with uh, your reading skills. Um, they can also, for example, if they realize that, like maybe inferring the meaning of unknown words, if that's a weak area, they'll help you through that, sentence analysis, et cetera. And um, we're going to leave a link for you in uh, today in the description with where you can sign up for this early access. So these won't launch until January. However, if you sign up, um, you're going to be put on the list. We're going to ask you simple questions such as your language level. We'll put you on the list. So you'll be the first to know um, about this uh, upcoming refresher course if you're interested in it. Um, and I'll try to put it on the link before we leave today, uh, put it in the chat before we leave today. But um, we're also going to be sending you a video replay of the session where we're going to leave the link there as well. So you'll be able to access that. Okay. Are there any questions on that reading and listening refresher course? There's no questions on the course, although if anybody has some, please put them in the chat. Um, but there was one more question about uh, finding keywords from text. Um, so the question is, are the keywords always in the question itself, or should they also uh, read all the answers and, and maybe the keywords they should be looking for in the text are also in the the answers to the questions, like the multiple choice answers? That is a great question. So one of the things that, um, actually, I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can answer the question face to face. Um, okay, so, um, one of the things that you will want to do is read the question for the keywords, but you'll notice that in the first example we gave, the keywords weren't exactly the same. They were just similar. So definitely keep that in mind. So it's not like you're going to find the exact words uh, within the um, possible response within the passage. Um, 
a good one to keep in mind, just like you mentioned, is to also read the possible answers for keywords too, uh, because um, you may find um, that some of the words are repeated, so that will be a clue. So like you may see the word repeated within the question and then within the possible answers. So that is a really good point to key, to bring up. So I appreciate that question. So yes, take a look at the possible uh, keywords within the answers to give you a clue as well. And if you see things repeated, most likely. Um, so thank you for that. Any other questions? Looks like that's it for today. So great questions, everyone. And I did put the link to the refresher course page um, in the chat in case anyone's interested in signing up to be uh, part of the launch in early 2023. Perfect. And then before I leave today, um, just a reminder that this is part one of a three-part series on uh, boosting your reading, listening, and speaking skills. So if you haven't signed up for parts two and three, listening and speaking, please do so. It's on our events page. It's on the original uh, bulletin that we sent out. And we will also send you a link um, after today's session uh, that will include the video and signing up for um, the refresher courses. Okay. Any last questions before we leave today? No? Okay, well, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for participating today. And I hope that you can put these strategies into use and ace your tests. Take care, everyone.